Elliot, I'm go you're going to have to be stuck with me for the MC for this evening, uh, and that's probably the easiest job up here, and that's one I hope I can handle. Now, uh, I want to say that I come into this meeting a little bit tired, and I want to say that uh, I'm real pleased to see the crowd that we've got here tonight, because we left Corning, Iowa uh, about 5 o'clock, or tried to leave Corning, Iowa about 5 o'clock Sunday morning, and we got in just a little over an hour ago. Now, uh, there was a chartered bus supposed to pick us up. He never, ever did show up. We got on Amtrak train uh, uh, Sunday night about 8.30 uh, in, in Creston, and we got as far as Hastings, Nebraska, and got stuck in the snow for six hours, stuck in the snow in Hastings, Nebraska, and we finally made it in here. So, And I'm sure you folks had some trouble getting in here, too, and I'm sure there will be a few more probably have some problems. But... Okay, I've asked Bob Pangburn if he would please uh, say the invocation and if, if you would stand for that, and please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Our Father in Heaven, as we gather together in this initial meeting of the 1984 Convention of the National Farmers Organization, we give thanks that you have guided us to a safe arrival. Watch over all of the members and friends of our organization who have not yet arrived and are still traveling toward Denver. We ask that this convention will be one of the best and that your presence will guide us, the delegates, and, the, and our decisions throughout this convention until our adjournment on Thursday evening. With your inspiration, we hope and pray that all of agriculture will come to the realization that to be successful in our endeavors to save farming for family farmers, we must all collectively combine our efforts and our goal can be obtained. Again, we ask for your blessings and guidance in this convention. We submit this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Flag's right over here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> the theme for this 1983 uh, uh, convention is collective bargaining needed more in 84, and you can see it right back there. And boy, nothing could be more uh, 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 truth than that. I run across a little clipping here the other day that I, I thought that made a little sense and I want to read it to you. Uh, the title of it is The Whole Truth. And it says, people who refuse to get involved in their organization are like two shipwrecked men in a lifeboat. From their end of the boat, the pair watched as those, as those at the other end bailed frantically to keep the boat afloat. One said to the other, thank heavens the hole is not in our end of the boat. Now I know we don't have those kind of people here. Now the fellow that I want to introduce to you uh, right away here wants to say a few words because he's got to run off to another uh, meeting right quick like, is your national president, Devon Woodland, and I'll guarantee you he's got a bucket in each hand and a bailing for all that he can. So. Devon. Thank you very much. First, let me say welcome to Denver. And those of us who made it, I hope, will be joined by those who are attempting to make it. And as Lee was telling and filling me in on some of the activities that they went through, he was talking about seven and eight foot snowdrifts that they were going through with Amtrak. And I suppose if you've got to be on the ground in such a condition, perhaps that's the safest. But it's good to have you here. This is your convention. This is the first official meeting of the convention. And uh, it's unknown at this point what effect this storm may have on our attendance. But the quality people are here are, are on their way. So we're going to have uh, a good convention we have plans made, and we hope that uh, they become uh, productive and that your participation in this convention can uh, increase. Uh, let me just say this. While you're here, 
I hope you make an effort to leave a thought or an idea, and that I hope you also make plans to take a thought or an idea with you when you leave. Now, it's a popular thing to become critical of people and particular politicians and those in positions of leadership. And I would hope as we spend these next three days in our convention, we talk about some of the good things, what might be right with agriculture, along with some of the things that we may talk about that may be wrong. And in spite of all the things we talk about and all the criticisms that we participate in, I want you to know that I know that we live in the best country in the world. And one of the things that makes it great is ownership of private property by people. And it's unique in the world now. Uh, the United States is one of those few countries that still has private ownership of property, land. And as I said in some of the meetings where we have international representatives in there discussing their society and how it impacts uh, their local communities. Uh, it becomes more and more apparent to me each day that we have the best country in the world and what makes it good is people participating in the system and contributing, taking from and adding to that, uh, that element in society which directly affects their life. So my short comments simply are this, welcome to Denver. And uh, it's the farthest west we've ever been, and I can guarantee you next year's convention you won't have snow because we'll be in Las Vegas, and it doesn't snow there. Does it? <laughs> it didn't the two times that I was there. All right, so uh, as we go through uh, this convention, our numbers will increase, I'm sure, because people, uh, delegates are registering in. And uh, hopefully the hall will be filled in the morning, and certainly as the day goes on, the numbers will build. And so again, it's good to be here with you. This is your convention. We're here to participate with you. And thank you, Lee. Thank you, Devon. Thank you, Devon. And as we talked about... Uh, the weather has probably hurt the attendance at this meeting. It also hurt a little bit uh, on, uh, on our speakers getting here, too. I've really got some good news for you and some bad news. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to give you the bad news. Uh, Jim Hightower, uh, Commissioner of Agriculture, who we had ho so hoped and he had promised would be here, uh, uh, couldn't make it because of the storm. And also Greg uh, Cusack, the Executive Director of National Catholic Real Life, uh, his plane couldn't get out of Des Moines today, so he's still back in Des Moines. And so we will not be having those two speakers, but the good news is we've got a real barn burner of a program for you anyway. So uh, uh, don't run away. You're not going to want to miss a minute of it. Uh, the next uh, speaker that I want to introduce to you, uh, uh, Jack McConnell. Uh, he's a farm director uh, of KFKA Radio in Greeley, Colorado and uh, former farm director of KMMJ uh, Radio, Grand Island, Nebraska, KEYL Radio, Long Prairie, Minnesota, KKSI uh, Radio, Mount Pleasant, Iowa, and KCLN uh, Radio, Clinton, Iowa. As the owner of a small farm in Goose Lake, Iowa, he was one of the mo modern immigrants from the city to rural life. Born in Chicago, Jack attended the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern Universities and uh, Loyola University and worked for the City News Bureau of Chicago, the old Chicago American, and part-time for WBBM radio and television. A veteran of four years in the Air Force, he served overseas in Korea and managed, as, uh, armed forces, uh, managed the Armed Forces uh, radio station. Also, during his service, he edited two different service uh, newspapers. Jack is a voting member of the National Association of Farm Broadcasters and was a regional director in 1981. He also has won the Associated Press Award for Farm Broadcasting in Nebraska two years in a row, along with two honorable mention awards from the Nebraska Broadcasters Association. As a member of National Ag Marketing Association, Jack has served as a State Ag Day Chairman three times. So uh, he comes to us well qualified. I do want to tell you a little story on Jack before I ask him to step up here. Uh, it seems uh, 
that uh, we were about ready to put uh, uh, three, uh, uh, three people into orbit uh, in one of these spaceships that goes around and around the Earth uh, many times, and they were going to do a little studying on, uh, on uh, how to, maybe they could develop agriculture a little more in space. And uh, the, three, uh, the three astronauts, one of them was going to be uh, uh, an American, and uh, one uh, was going to be a Russian, and, uh, and the other one, uh, since it was going to be a, an ag-related uh, 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 orbit, uh, and they were going to be up there for a full year studying agriculture, they thought they ought to take a farm a new uh, a broadcaster along with them to cover. Well, anyway, they got just about down to the zero hour, ready to blast off, and they come a-rushing out, they say, gosh, we're 300 pounds light. We, we just got to have 300 pounds uh, uh, more weight. So they opened the hatch and they said, say, can you, any of you fellas in here think of 100 pounds more weight that you could add uh, that uh, we need the 300 pounds more weight? So the American thought for a little while and he says, boy, a year in space is a long time without any love. He says, how about a nice 100-pound blue-eyed blonde? He says, I'd be glad to take her along. And, uh, well, that's just fine. So they fixed him up uh, with a blue-eyed blonde, and the Russian, he thought for a little while, and he says, man, a year in space is going to be an awful long time without any vodka. So he says, I'll just take my 100 pounds in vodka. And uh, Jack here, he says, well, he says, you know, he says, I'm a pretty heavy smoker, and uh, a year in space uh, without any cigarettes is going to be an awful long time. So he says, I'll just take my 100 pounds in cigarettes. Well, they spent their year in orbit, and they went around a good many times, and, and they had landed, and, and the first one off was the American, and his wife right behind him, and, and she was carrying a, a, a real a, a nice little young'un. And uh, the second one off was, uh, was the, the Russian, and boy, he come out of there just a shake, and he says, man, he says, what a hangover. And uh, Jack steps out, and he was just shaking all over, and he says, has anybody got a match? <laughs> Jack McConnell. <laughs> you betcha, has anyone got a match? Mm. Well, as they say, I'm the uh, transplant out here, been out here since June, so I'll make the official welcome. Welcome to cool, colorful, casual, and you bet, snowy Colorado. <laughs> this is the place. Just for the uh, record, uh, the last couple of days, uh, we got it. Denver had 23 inches officially of uh, snow in uh, Greeley, the hometown that we're in. Uh, they were talking about 13.5 inches of snow, but again, we had 40 mile an hour winds, so it's all gone to Nebraska. And how'd you like Hastings? Mm -hmm. That's where it is. First of all, we want to thank everybody uh, in the NFO. We want to thank Devon for inviting us uh, to be up here and to visit with you folks. Some of you might be interested in, uh, again, uh, if you were on the train for the last couple of days, you might have been out of contact and you want to know what the markets did today. Uh, in futures trading, December cattle were at 63.62, and February were up 40 at 63.52. Feeder cattle, January was up 75 at 67.30. March was up 47 at 67.80. We're still losing money. Hogs closed up a nickel to down 62. December was down 62 at $42. And February was down 45 at 47.42. And uh, if you're messing around with uh, the grains, we do a survey every, every, actually every afternoon for our station on uh, grain prices in Greeley and Weld County. And uh, we quote corn by the hundredweight. So we had local corn today at 590 to $6. Truck corn was steady at 6.15 to 6.20, rail corn 5 up at 6.30 to 6.40. The barley was steady at 5.20 to 5.30, oats were steady, 5.60 to 5.70. Ordinary wheat 6 up at 3.27, 12% wheat was steady to 6 down at 3.40 and 13% wheat, 10 down at 3.56. Anyone messing around with pinot beans? Okay, the new crop was steady at 20 to 20, 50, and old crop at $18. So it gives you an idea of what the prices were today. So if you didn't hear the settlements or the closing. We were going to uh, have Jim Hightower here, and uh, we see the, the Texas sign right in back there, and we were going to get on his case a little bit because uh, we always like the boys from Texas. And, uh, of course, he wrote a couple of books. And when they talk about Texas, I think of one of our favorite stories we've heard about Texas. You know, they talk about everything being big in Texas. Everything's big, no matter where you go in Texas. 
Well, there was an old boy that walked in a bar in Fort Worth. Going to have a few drinks. Going to have some big drinks. He didn't have doubles or triples. He had quads. They serve a drink that was that big. So he's, he had about four or five of them, and uh, nature took its course. So he calls the bartender and says, hey, hey, come here. So where's the little boy's room? Son, you're in Texas. When you're in Texas, everything is big, and by God, we call it the big boy's room. All right, where's the big boy's room? It's down the hall. So the boy turns around and he says, man, this is it. So he heads down the hall. Now, he's got a pretty good uh, load going to get down there. He's a little trouble navigating. So he figures just to keep his hand in front of him. He goes down the hall, out the door. He's now in the alley. He's still rolling. Man, this guy's he's, he's hurting now. Oh, he pushes another door in, and it happens to be the YMCA. He keeps right on going. He goes down this hallway. He pushes another door open. This happens to be the pool. And what happens? You know it. Right into the pool he goes. He's in the pool, treading water. Two guys come by, and they look there, and they say, Say, son, what you doing in that pool with all your clothes on? Turns around, he looks at him, and he says, My Lord, he says, I know everything's big in Texas, but good God, please don't flush it. <laughs> Well, again, we talk about, we want to talk a little bit about uh, farm broadcasters. We talk about farm broadcasters. We just had our meeting down in Kansas City a couple weeks ago. There's 305 of us, 305 professional farm broadcasters throughout this country. And you, as farmers, have 305 of the closest intimate friends that you can possibly think of. We're professional farm broadcasters. That's all we do. Again, we're in your pickups, right? You listen to us on the, in your pickups on the radio. We're at your breakfast table in the morning. We're out in the barns. You listen to us in the barns. Did you ever really realize how intimate we really are? Fran, you know how many bedrooms I'm in every morning? Shudder you shudder to think, but again, you got to think of things like that. We're, we are on the radio, and again, it's usually in the morning and during the afternoon. We're fighting for the American farmer. We're trying to keep track of agriculture. We keep track of agriculture, and believe me, it gets awful involved. You see us out at your 4-H fairs. You see us at the colleges and the universities. You see us trying to keep up on products. And do we travel? You bet we do. Last year, I traveled 29,000 air miles. This was just air miles. I went to uh, lettuce fields out in California. We did a thing on a little old white fly out there eating up the lettuce. I was up in the coal strip mines in Montana, cotton fields in Texas. And I was, again, at Disneyland East, right, Washington. So. <laughs> So we, uh, we've seen it all as far as that goes, and we still do travel. Again, uh, as far as the 305 broadcasters, yep, we get up early. You bet we do, and it's, it goes with the territory. Sometimes it gets to be a long day. Uh, we get up at 3.20 every morning, and we're in the office at 4, on the air at 5. And I do know some broadcasters who have networks, and they're up at 2 in the morning. Now, as far as the farm broadcasters go, we're going to give a little plug for the farm broadcasters. A lot of you, if you're from Iowa, Nebraska, you know Creighton Canal from KMA and Shenandoah. Creighton was our past president last year of the National Association of Farm Broadcasters. Creighton came up and he said this was the year of the farm broadcaster. And why was it the year of the farm broadcaster? Namely, because of what we gave you and you got it quick. Remember January the 20th of last year? What happened? The PIC program? You don't think we were sweating that. We were. We were sweating it as much as you were because we were trying to get the information on this, and we had people who didn't even know what they were talking about. I'll give you a prize example. I was in Grand Island. On the 15th of January, the corn growers were going to be meeting over in Kearney. I get a call from them. They said, would you pick up Ray Lett, who is the special assistant to John Block at the airport in Grand Island, driving to Kearney. It's 40 miles. So I got out to the airport, I picked up Ray Lett, got in the pickup truck, 
I've taken them over there and I said, what is the deal on the PIC program? Where do we stand on this? What's going down on this? What's going to be the setup on it? So five days before the program, he says, I don't know. He says, we're going to have meetings right up until the time we announce it. This is the special assistant to the Ag Secretary. All right. The announcement was made on the 20th. The farm broadcasters had it either the same day or the next day, and you heard it from department officials. And again, I say the commercial part of it was you didn't wait two weeks for your state farm newspaper to have it in there. You didn't wait one month for the slicks to have it. You had it the next day. Secondly, if you're from the Midwest, you had the drought. I feel sort of smug about sitting out here in Colorado. I came out here and, uh, Lord, they still had showers out here. But again, I heard about the drought. I was in contact with other farm broadcasters on this. But you heard about the drought declarations, the emergency counties. You heard them from your farm broadcaster. You heard them the next morning after they were announced. You couldn't wait two weeks for the State Farm Magazine, and you couldn't wait a month for the slicks to come out. Again, when you talk about uh, farm broadcasters, you know who they are. You know who they are locally. You folks are from Montana right down here, right? You know County Burns up there, right? Wisconsin, right? You're from Wisconsin? Johnny Zimmer up in, in Madison. He's, he's up there. He's got a network up there. I can go right down the line in other parts here because these farm broadcasters, we get to know each other. We work with each other. And as far as uh, when we talk about farm broadcasters, I've got another short story to tell you. Talk about farm broadcasters going out and get them. Story about a uh, burglar. This old burglar, he's in a, goes into a house, and he starts picking up the jewelry and the silver, the fancy silver. He's got his bag with him. He's going right down the line. He hears something behind him. He turns around, he looks. Here's a Doberman Pinscher, about 110 pounds of black Doberman Pinscher. And mean as they come, and he's just looking at him. So the boy turns around, he looks at, looks at the Doberman, looks at the silver and that, and he thinks, well, maybe I'll keep trying it. So he starts moving along the line, picking up more silver. All of a sudden, he hears a voice say, what are you doing? Looks around. It wasn't the dog, but he sees a parakeet up in a cage. It's a little parakeet. He goes, well, there's nothing, as long as I keep an eye on the dog. So he keeps moving. The dog just walks along and sits and watches him. About every five minutes, the voice would come out, what are you doing? He didn't do it. Finally, he picks up his bag. He's got all the silver, all the jewelry. He starts to head out the door, and finally the parakeet says again, what are you doing? Burglar turns around, he looks at the parakeet, and he says, is that all you can say? The parakeet goes, mm-mm, sick him. <laughs> again, uh, we talk about uh, some of the silly things and they're telling you stories about uh, things like that. One thing that we did, and uh, as Lee mentioned in the, uh, in the introduction, I was State Ag Day Chairman, and I'd like to sort of summarize and put everything together on an article that we picked up, we did a little refinement on, and we've used it every year, and it's a positive note about the American farmer. It's a story that needs to be told not only to you, but to many of the urban people, and they have to hear it. This is what we try to do day in and day out. But on Ag Day, which is usually right after what we call the High Holy Day, St. Patrick's Day, it's usually in that week, we put this together and we do it no matter where we've been. It's called I'm an American Farmer. I'm not part of a dying breed, although there are fewer of us every year. They say there are more than two million of us, but less than half of us can make a full-time living on the farm. Those of us who make a living at farming are never sure what that living will be. When prices are high, we often don't have anything to sell. When they're low, well, we can't eat it all by ourselves. Some of us think we might be better off just to sell everything, go to Las Vegas, and bet everything on one roll of the dice, but can't take the thrill out of it. By farming, we get to gamble every single day. Every storm, every drought is another turn of the dice. Well, we've been farming for a long time we're on this land. I really don't know where my ancestors came from. It was somewhere back east, Virginia, the Carolinas, Pennsylvania, maybe. At some point, they decided to push westward. They didn't have anything, I know that. The ones who had anything, they stayed home. So many of us went west. We went past the Shenandoah, the Blue Ridge, past the Ohio, the Missouri. 
They peopled the forlorn, lonely valleys of this vast continent. They broke the plains and tamed the savage land. They settled beside the rivers. You know what they are, the Kaw, the Platte, the Red, the Wabash, the Illinois. They planted crops in lush valleys and places so barren you couldn't raise hell with a gallon of whiskey. Then slowly commerce sprung up, the villages, the towns, then cities. The railroads, yep, they hauled our produce. Blacksmiths, the implement dealers, supplied our tools. Shops sold us the little luxuries that made our hard life just a little bit easier. We grew the corn, drove the cattle herds, raised the hogs, planted the wheat, reaped the bounty of the rich land, and a nation grew and prospered right along with us. We were good at what we did. We did it better than anyone else had ever done it. We fed and clothed ourselves, then our neighbors, then our countrymen, and then the world. We not only made two blades of grass grow where one grew before, we made the crops and herds grow where nothing had lived before. And because we did our work so well and produced so much, fewer and fewer of us were needed. We made it possible for millions to move to town, to work in the offices, the factories, to go to colleges, to write books and symphonies, to learn the healing arts and the builder's skills. So only soon, only a relatively handful, handful of us were left on the land. And those who people, the cities and the suburbs, began to forget where they came from. They no longer felt a closeness to the land. They no longer worried about their daily bread. The meat, the fruit, and the grains seemed to appear in the stores if by magic. Now for every farmer, there's about 68 to 70 people who never soil their hands or feel the sun sting. Who never fret about the next meal because their next meal is always going to be coming. They've been freed from want, and you know what? They cannot name their liberator. But despite the uncertainties, despite the declining numbers, despite our paper prosperity, we go on farming. What we ask is little enough. A chance to own the land we work, a chance to earn a decent life on that land. A chance to pass that land and its living onto our children and our grandchildren. And to have it all just a little bit better for, those, for them than it was for us. Now, there's ones that say on the USDA building in Washington, these words are engraved if you've ever been there, and it says, to the husbandman belongs the first fruits of his labor. So that's from the Bible, and it means, well, if you produced it, you ought to have the first crack at making something from your effort. Well, it's a simple enough concept, except it's awful easy to forget. There's another larger message to be learned and relearned. Cities and empires have passed away, and they will pass away again, but the land remains, and with a promise of renewal. So what do we do? We remain on the land that we love. We grow the crops, feed the cattle, make the homes, raise the families. It's a story as old as time, new as the first buds of spring. We look across the land we possess. Each one of us can say as a wise old soul said once long ago, it's a poor thing, but it's my own. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't come to hear me speak, but uh, I want to get in just a real short commercial because if you'll notice right behind me here, uh, uh, the theme this year, uh, collective bargaining is needed more in 84. And boy, nothing could be further from the truth. And I'll tell you, the average farmer out there is getting desperate. He needs help and he needs it bad and he knows it. And you'd be surprised how many calls we're getting in to the home office from people right in counties that uh, have got a uh, substantial organization in that wants more information about the National Farmers Organization. Just two, just before we came from the convention, uh, to the convention this past week, I got one from Ohio and one from Michigan. Both, both counties had substantial organization in. Both of them pretty substantial farmers. So uh, they're looking. Now, don't forget, everybody likes to do business with somebody that's doing business. Now, where I come in is I'm going to try to help you make it look like we're doing business, which we are, but we got to let the people know. And one of the ways to do that is to get up our gate signs, get on our bumper stickers, get an NFO cap on everybody. Now, I think probably for money spent, the NFO cap is the very best advertising gimmick that there is because it comes eyeball to eyeball with the people that you got to convince yet. And